Uh, in fact, uh, our background is, is perhaps a little bit broader, and let me just quickly give you the broad picture of what we do, because there are three different companies. So there's Waymo Financial, which is a corporate advisory firm in natural resources. We also run an asset management firm, which is a multifamily office, where we run sophisticated investment strategies for high net worth individuals. And there's Waymo Space, which I can't help but just mention briefly, because that includes uh, a lot of fun, uh, which includes, in particular, my 2008 skydive over Mount Everest. I'm an adventure. Uh, it also includes my three trips to space uh, on three different rocket ships, uh, so we like to go where risk is, uh, where, uh, is available. Um, so we have a lot of fun uh, doing that on the adventure front, but we also do it with purpose and we try to give back to society, and in particular by inspiring children, uh, by showing sort of a good example of living out the dreams and uh, giving back, by hoping to motivate kids like these kids here from the, not far from here actually, uh, out in uh, Tower Hamlets, uh, where we've been running a 12 months uh, school program. So that's also part of the uh, full picture. Obviously that's not what we're going to spend too much time on today, although I'd love to do that. Um, but what I would like to do is just take two steps back and look at this sort of macro picture because when the commodities is a little bit down in the doldrums at the moment, I think it's very important to remind ourselves about the macro picture because the macro picture is very much still intact, it's very strong and it's there. And we can see it when we look out at GDP growth uh, far out. We see here clearly that uh, there's a bit of rocket ship going on here in the BRICS. It is clearly taking off and that trend is still very much there. And we shouldn't forget that when we go through tough commodity times as we do at the moment. There's many ways of looking at it. I'll show you a couple of examples. Energy is another way of looking at it. The blue line is the OECD um, demand and the red line is basically the emerging new world. There's no doubt where the world is heading. EM is going to be dominating. However you look at it, you could also look at it from the GDP looking out to 2050. You see as well China in particular really taking up sort of uh, on the rocket launch pad in com even compared to the US and, and clearly overtaking in terms of the size of the economy and that will drive commodities uh, fundamentally. Um, if you break it down into sort of the new BRICS, which we find particularly interesting, China, India and, and, and Russia obviously cl clearly very interesting, but the new BRICS is an area where we are focusing on a lot of our investment interest. We think there's a very good uh, degree of alpha available. In the classic, say, strategies of long, short European stocks and things like that, um, tough to find the, the sort of edge or the alpha. If you look into some of the new countries, we find it very, very interesting and we are indeed investing into hedge funds uh, in these particular countries. Uh, again, another way of looking at it, uh, across the metal space, copper, zinc, lead, pick your metal. China has gone from 10%, 20% to 40% of global demand. So clearly it's still very important to, to, uh, to look at what China is doing. Or look at the steel, uh, uh, annual steel production, US flatlining, China really taking off. EM is where the action is, let's not forget it. Another way of doing it is just looking at two pictures. This is Shanghai about 1990, this is Shanghai today. Two pictures says it all, let's not forget. Um, so the macro picture for, for, for the metal space and the commodity space in general is still very much there. One thing I think also from the debate this morning which is quite clear is of great interest is gold. What to do with it? And I think the debate this morning is quite reflective of that. There's bears, there's bulls. So where to come out? I think it's really tough. It's a tough question because on one hand, the fundamentals are still there. On the other hand, there are some things that are changing in terms of the, econo uh, the global economy and the US economy in particular. Let me go through a little bit my thesis and I'll share my view on gold in particular. So this is obviously gold as we've seen it. So clearly it's been a fantastic bull market. Very nice. Uh, sorry for Gordon Brown who checked out a little bit too early. Um, but we've had a very, very nice run, those who went long. But the question is, from this point on, which was about the spring of this year, something changed. And there was a week, you know, so you all remember it, there was three things that changed. Cyprus was forced to put 400 million euros of their gold up for sale. And there was a risk um, that people thinking Spain or Portugal might be up, up next. That causes a bit of stir in the market. Goldman's put uh, gold on their, on their sh uh, top short list as one of their top ideas. That didn't help sentiment for gold. Sokjen put out a report saying this is the end of the gold area. And at the same time, you also had better economic data out of the US, which in principle is good, and that means life is getting back to normal, so we're getting out of the cave. 
And also China had a bit of a hiccup on their GDP numbers, uh, which meant that Chinese demand was probably going to be a little bit less than we uh, originally had, had thought. Those elements led to this drop that we see here. And that drop was very significant, not necessarily in fundamental terms, but it was very significant in terms of sentiment. And I think this really sort of captures where we are at the moment. On one hand, there's a very strong fundamental picture, still, in my view, on gold. On the other hand, life is changing and risk appetite is changing. If you look at just where we are in terms of demand, gold demand, it's quite interesting to see that obviously physical gold, which is the blue one here, we've seen a pickup in terms of purchase over time. If you look back since 2003, it has clearly picked up. Jewelry is sort of fairly stable, come off a little bit on a relative basis. Uh, but central banks net-net have turned from sellers to buyers. Especially interesting is if you look, look back at very recent data, in particular Q2, you see some very, very interesting dynamics within the whole gold space. One area is, if you look at the ETFs, something which we invest in, uh, the ETFs uh, in gold has actually come down quite significantly. In fact, Q2 2013, we saw the biggest drop in ETF investments net-net in gold. Very interesting. The other thing we saw in gold is we saw the biggest pickup in demand on physical gold. So basically what happened was the Chinese and the Indians went out and bought physical gold. Why? Because it's gotten cheaper. So these price changes we've seen over the past six months has really had a, a dramatic impact in terms of what goes on in the gold space. ETF levels down, the biggest downfall we've, we've ever seen in terms of volume net-net, and physical demand up by the highest. And this is driven by, if you do a survey, as is done here by the World Gold Council, that the Ch Chinese and the Indian uh, consumers are still fundamentally very, very bullish on it. So that's a strong, good, fundamental argument. The other thing we've seen is recycling. So taking old gold and recycling, jewelry, recycling into new, to, to, to new gold, that has actually come off. As prices have come down, the level of, of recycling has also come off. And that's quite normal. Because prices fall, consumers get less eager to sell their gold because they think there might be a better day to come. So that particular element, recycling, is sensitive to where the absolute gold price lies. And that has come off a bit. So net-net, I think we should say the, the, the gold space is going through a very interesting time at the moment where, where the financial instruments are not being put on so much and the physical buying has really picked up quite dramatically. Another way of looking into the gold space or the mining space for that matter, apart from the financial instruments, is obviously looking into stocks. And that's an area that we do as well, particularly within the advisory business. So we look through the sort of life cycle of a mining stock well, we ideally like to get involved sort of at the point where there is a deformed, confirmed uh, deposit because there's usually a bit of a value uptick there. Then all the hard work starts, all the extra financing can be a little bit tough sometimes. But as the market gets confidence and we get closer to there's actually going to be a mine here, gold mine, copper mine, what have you. At that point, there's usually quite a bit of a spike up in terms of value and we'd like to get involved at that point. In terms of the dynamics, dynamics we see within the large cap space and the small mid cap space at the moment, here are some of the themes we're going through. Large cap companies, they're seeing cost cutting. They're seeing plenty of debt available, funny enough. We talk about banks not having capital. In the big space, there certainly is debt capital available. But the management teams, they are typically being changed and they're typically having a very tough time delivering on share performance. Share performance has been uh, not very good, to say the least. And we also see some big write-downs in terms of project values as commodity prices have, uh, have been falling. Within the small and mid-cap companies, we see them very, very having a hard time uh, finding capital or getting access to capital. We see valuations trading at completely ridiculous levels, and there are some companies you can actually pick up at a very, very interesting price, completely detached from NAV or DCF values you, you might take on it. And then you also see some companies being put into can maintenance. And we will probably also see more bankruptcy, bankruptcies uh, taking place. Uh, I won't give you sort of the full list of some of the companies we follow or we look at, but here's a few good ideas potentially of stocks we think are completely oversold or certainly are not trading at the right value where it, where it ought to be. Uh, Talga, one of the biggest um, graphite deposits in the world, very sort of good 
counterproductive um, uh, ca counter um, um, uh, stock to to the Chinese domination. Gold world resources, Maya, near-term silver production in in, um, in Morocco and green and minerals, big uranium rare de deposit, and millennium minerals, which is gold in Australia. On millennium, the last one, kind of interesting to see what happens when the mine goes into production. Here we have millennium minerals bumping along, bumping along. Here we have production happening. But look at this. The moment the market gets confidence that this thing is actually going to get financed, bang, you get a very, very big uplift. So you want to get involved just before that, ideally. Once the confidence is there, it goes up. First gold comes out. Some people start taking profit. It comes all the way down again. And then we wait for some new, new good news on upgrades on production. Another area we like a lot, actually, mining has its challenges, is oil, just like the previous speakers. We think there's a very interesting dynamics there at the moment in terms of supply and demand. Uh, sure, there is a bit of US shale gas going on, which puts extra uh, supply into the equation, and it certainly has <laughs> strong geo geopolitical uh, consequences. But the oil industry and the oil services industry in particular, we find is very, very interesting. Uh, there's also going to be a lot of M&A activities. Here's a list uh, from uh, VSA Capital that's identified a number of, of these uh, potential takeout targets. So uh, both from a banking point of view, but also from a value creation point of view, these ones might be quite interesting to take a look at. And uh, at the same time, we also see uh, a bit of dry up of capital. In terms of from, from the juniors, you can see here on AIM stocks, the capital available for oil and gas and for mining has sort of come down quite a bit. But I think there's a sentiment shift that might lead to a bit of this, uh, this space coming back in again. The other themes we look at sort of more generally includes food, green energy. I think there's a lot of interesting areas there, emerging markets. And we keep an eye on, on the good selective mining stocks. This is just briefly our performance uh, so far. Past 18 months, we're up about 30%. Um, so our portfolio manager has been Quite lucky, I guess, in that regard. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much, Pip. Any uh, any questions? Yes, please. Uh, with regard to the uh, emerging market, sorry, sorry. Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, Roland Beals from uh, Coke Supply and Trading. Um, with regard to emerging market demand, uh, some of the projections which you which you have basically say, okay, well, it's going to be a very strong story. Um, I was wondering about the assumptions which you've got behind those and whether or not there's an argument that a little bit like how uh, um, people in Africa never had a landline, they just went straight to, straight to mobile phones, that in terms of demand profile, energy consumption doesn't follow the path which it has done in the developed world and actually jumps to something which is much more energy efficient and sort of bypasses some of those numbers a bit. I was just wondering what your assumptions are. It's quite clear that there will be some, uh, like the mobile versus fixed line, etc. stories where the emerging market can actually jump. But the, but the, the fact remains that they still need uh, commodities to build buildings, to, to create infrastructure. And that is uh, by far uh, a very, very big driver of, of this. If you look at the Chinese uh, uh, road program, highway road program, it, it is uh, equivalent to what the US did many, many, many years ago. Uh, and on an on a, on a even bigger scale. So. So in terms of the, the, the size of these infrastructure projects, these actual physical buildings and stuff like that, still needs to go up. I mean, we, we, we ain't done yet. Um, it, it is very, very significant. So although there's some sub dynamics, like you correctly indicate there, it's not going to spoil the picture. The line is very, very clear in terms of uh, this shift. I mean, this is a real shift, seismic shift, that's taking place in the old world versus the new world. And, and that shift, uh, commodities will have a very big role to play in. And that remains intact. So just uh, as a follow-up question to that, is that in the, given that the, the growth is going to be there in commodities per se, is there something which you think will be more part of that growth cycle than what we'd historically seen? So uh, I guess oil is the classic one, where the economic linkage used to be very clear. Uh, you know, maybe it's been copper, is it now rare earth metals, or is there something else which you see as the... Uh, is connected to that growth picture. I, I think the, the obvious way to play this is through the commodity cycle. So, so it's, it, it is obviously the metals and, and, and it's the natural resources in the first place. Uh, the next thing is, is, is energy, because energy consumption will shift to a high level once a Chinese person has bought a car 
that he or she has finally saved up for for the past five years is not going to let it go just because oil prices goes up a little bit. They will keep driving, maybe a little bit less, but structurally we've moved to a higher level. So I think the commodity theme, the commodity play, is very much there and very much intact. I think the bigger question is, can you transition the, those economies into true consumer-led co economies? And I think if you go to Russia, the, the, there's still a question mark there, uh, very much so. I mean, there's a lot happening in Russia, uh, and it has gotten better, and uh, etc. but it is still a very much of a natural resource-led economy. Um, so they're, they're clearly having a little bit of a tougher time. The big question will be see if China can can execute on that and become much more consumer-led. Because so far, a lot of it has been driven by infrastructure and government decisions and what have you. That's sort of the easy bet. But what you really got to have is, is real GDP ending up in people's pockets, and they start spending. And that's where you get a, a, a real long uh, growth story out of it. And, and some of those economies still have to make that transition. Thank you. Pete, do you want to talk a little bit about um Kind of natural resource equities, kind of versus taking taking a direct commodities play. I mean, are there any circumstances where you feel it makes it's, more, it's better sense to buy the underlying commodity rather than the equity, or, or do you do you always think the equity is the better play? Yeah, so we, we, we play through uh, both the equities and also we run an, an, an ETF-based uh, strategy where we, we have a proprietary model that sort of spits out what ETFs to buy and what to sell. So some of that is based a little bit of clever computers, if you like, and, and a bit of portfolio management. Um, uh, and that's been the secret behind, uh, I guess, most of, of, of this stuff uh, we've got there. That, that's essentially our ETF strategy that's, that's kicking in there. Uh, not, too, not, not a lot of volatility, but just sort of steady eddies that are growing. And that's quite nice. So if you can come up with a clever model that does that, then fantastic. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the mining stocks, in particular the small mid-caps, I think you've got to know when to get in and, and, and when to get out because these things are, they, they trade through cycles. So there are times where you, where, like now, where things are completely bombed out, where there is assets available at a massive discount and you can pick up very, very large percentages of companies that actually, in time, ought to do extremely well. So you're talking about a multiplier, certainly more than 30%, you'll do X times your money up. Uh, at higher risk. Um, so the key thing is to remember th those cycles these things go through and, and not get too greedy. I mean, this is Warren Buffett stuff. You know, don't get too greedy on the top. Uh, get very greedy when everybody is fearful. I mean, it's as simple as that. And I think right now we're probably at the, at the time where, where uh, it's time to get greedy and load up on, on some, of the, some of the mining stocks and the small, small cap stocks and the oil and gas because some of them will, will have a good time. But still, careful stock, stock selection is, is, uh, is very, very important. Great, thanks. Uh, if there are other questions, please uh, join me in uh, thanking Pear Women very much. Thank you.